So in this video, part two of lecture one, we map out some of the big paradigm issues by comparing quantitative and qualitative research. Way. Shut up and sit down. Okay, so let's get started. Now, as I flagged in the previous video, I'm going to talk about how quantitative and qualitative methodology differ on type of questions, type of data, sampling, role of the researcher, quality and epistemology and ontology. <coughs> Excuse me, big words. <laughs> it takes, you get stuck in your throat. Epistemology, ontology. Now, here's a summary of page four of our prescribed text, but I've added in some of the content from chapter two as well, just to fully flesh out the differences here. But I'll also cover the table on page 22. Now, this is a really good table that will help you see the differences in more concrete terms through a worked example. And on this slide, I've just given a summary of that table. The actual table is much larger. I would really encourage you to spend some time reading through it a few times. So this table summarizes two research papers that are focused on the same social issue. They're looking at the risk of unprotected sex, but they're also using different methodologies. One is, quant quant one is quantitative and one is qualitative. Look, I can't even say quantitative. That's how committed I am to qualitative. So the description of the issue under quantitative research paradigm is one of a linear relationship, i.e. one thing maps simply to another. One plus one equals two, that's all we've learned. And in this instance, it's between level of knowledge about risks and risk-taking behaviours. So here, to reduce risk among the public, you increase public knowledge about the risk. Now, the description of the issue under a qualitative research paradigm is quite different. Here, there's much more complex, much more of a complex relationship. It's a complicated relationship. There's sexual stuff. Uh, one that involves people's life circumstances and lifestyles. And we see that polydimensional aspect of the qualitative paradigm here. So risk-taking behaviors are seen as shaped by gender, sexual orientation, age, alcohol use, relationship commitment, and so on. Now, one way of characterizing it is when someone gives you an explanation for something you've done and you reply, well, it's not that straightforward. You know, that's an indication that you're looking for more of a qualitative explanation, more complex explanation. Excuse me whilst I sweat away here. Still hot, I think. Hey, what's the, tem what's the temperature outside? In Annandale, it's currently 31. 31. There you go, it's cooler, but still hot for me. So, um, <laughs> back to the point. So, linear, so linear relationships are more straightforward and are less likely to capture how people actually experience things, particularly social phenomena. Now, the other thing is that um, is important here is the way that the issue is understood under each paradigm. Now, under a quantitative paradigm, Unprotected sex means risky sex and is a negative thing. I know there are risks involved, serious risks. But under a qualitative paradigm, unprotected sex has meaning for the person who's engaged in that behavior. For example, one meaning is that it signifies showing trust in a sexual partner. So the practice of unprotected sex is embedded in these sort of meanings and this one being the meaning of a relationship you have with another person. That's just one aspect of it. There are also gender influences, generational issues, and so on. So it's that idea again that it's polydimensional. And some of these dimensions sit beyond the person, you know, they're broader cultural issues. No, oh, it's about culture. It's about art. Oh, come on, Kirsten. So we have a much more complex relationship here, a much more complex picture of the social issue under a qualitative paradigm. It's not simply a linear relationship. So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at in more detail at um, a qualitative research paper so you can see how this actually all plays out when someone's writing up their research. You know, getting that 
complex polydimensional view of a social phenomenon. Hello, Polly! Now, let's go back to our first table to look at the other key differences between quantitative and qualitative paradigms. This is data. So this second point is all about data. Data shortages, data rationing, data black markets. Qualitative and quantitative research paradigms are they're forms of empirical research. We're talking about empirical research. Empirical means knowledge that's based on data that's obtained through some form of observation. But qualitative and quantitative research, they collect very different forms of data. Now, one way of thinking about this is that qualitative data is raw data in the sense that it is yet to be codified by the researcher into a form that's amenable to analysis. So quantitative data has already been processed because it's turned an observation into a number. And observations don't come to us generally as raw numbers. You know, we're not Nero living in the matrix. <laughs> we don't see numbers, but things are converted into numbers for us. So the, the, the data has to be first converted into a scale. So even before you can collect the data, you've got to find a scale or a test or a tool that's going to convert an observation into a numerical score. So if you're interested in resilience, for example, you need to find a resilience scale that will give you a quantitative measure of resilience. And I see that inside each of you is a strength that cannot be measured. <laughs> so even before you start observing, you have to make a decision as to how your observation is going to be processed. What sort of tool or scale are you going to use? Now, that's not really the case with qualitative research. You know, you can meet someone and start talking to them before you even formally decided how you're going to process what that person's going to say you know, before you've chosen your method of analysis. You're very eloquent. Now, that doesn't mean that when someone talks and you record what they say, that that talk is unprocessed. It's always being filtered. But when you're listening, um, we... Uh, yeah, when, when we're listening, we're filtering what someone's saying. Um, we're making sense of it, and that's that part of the processing of the data. It's what we call reflexivity. And I'm going to talk about reflexivity in just a little while. Now, in our unit, we're going to primarily focus on the method of the individual interview. We're going to be talking with a participant one-to-one, -one, but there are lots of other methods available to qualitative uh, research, you know, group interviews, uh, but we also analyze text and images. He looks at pictures. Now, because data is processed into numbers under quantitative method, that data has already lost a bit of detail. It's already a summary of the thing that was being observed. So a numerical score of resilience is a summary of a person's state of resilience. It lacks detail. We don't seem to have her data. You know, it's quite a broad, all-encompassing ph uh, phenomena. You know, it encompasses the totality of that phenomena called resilience through that numerical score. Now, qualitative data tends to be much more richly detailed. Uh, sometimes the detail can be pretty overwhelming, so we often have to narrow down our uh, focus on a specific aspect of a topic, because otherwise we just get too much information. Please, don't continue to tell me anymore. Remember that I'm not saying that qualitative data is better than quantitative data. The worth of the data depends on the extent it's going to answer the research question that you pose. You know, does it serve the purpose of your research. And if you want to know how many people have been diagnosed with depression in Australia, for example, you wouldn't go around asking people how they feel about depression using qualitative methods. What you do is undertake some form of quantitative survey, probably an audit of summative medical records kept at a federal level. Now, on to sampling. Here we see another big difference between quantitative and qualitative. The way sample size and sample method is handled. Now let's start with sample size because quantitative data tends to lack detail but has breadth. So here's where you need that large sample size. So to be confident that your data is actually showing something, you have to collect it from lots of people 
or lots of sources. And a lack of detail becomes less of a problem with your data when you have a large sample. So if you're measuring depression, to know one person's score on a depression scale only tells you something about that one person. And actually not a lot about that person, uh, but it tells you something about that one person. But if you know the depression scale of a whole population of people, you suddenly have some really interesting data. It's not data about an individual, but it's data about a population. Suddenly, that lack of detail doesn't become an issue because you're capturing the big full breadth of the question that you're trying to answer, which is prevalence of depression across a population. I don't know, if can you hear this helicopter going overhead? We shall pause for a second and let it pass. <clears throat> okay, it's passed. It's gone that away. That means nothing to you, I know. But for some reason, I feel a need to indicate the direction of the path of the helicopter. Anyway, God, really bringing things alive here, aren't I? <laughs> Talk about too much detail. <laughs> let, me, let me get on with this. So, with qualitative data, you've got lots of data coming from one person. Now, if you try, uh, try process, to process a similar amount of data from the whole population, you're just going to get completely overwhelmed by the data. You'd have to simplify the data in some way quite considerably before you could really make sense of it. And usually you'd have to turn it into numbers. You know, you'd have to quantify the data somehow because you just got too much data to process. Make ready to make it number three. So if you want to stick with qualitative data, you probably want to keep your sample size relatively small. You're looking to keep that richness of detail in your data without becoming overwhelmed by it. You know, if you're talking to one person about their life story, yeah, you could handle that. You talk to two, you could probably handle that. You're talking to a thousand, you're just getting absolutely swamped in all of the detail. How the, how the, he <laughs> how the heck do you get through that amount of detail? Yeah, so you know what I mean. Okay. Now with qualitative work, you know when you've got enough qualitative data, when you've achieved something called saturation. You know, you get a sense of having heard everything you need to hear on the topic. And you know you got to this point when you close an interview because you feel you've exhausted the topic. The person is saying nothing new. They're just repeating other stuff they've already told you in the interview. And you're doing the same thing all over again. Now, sometimes you can't exhaust the topic by only talking to one person. You know, there's still gaps in your understanding of the topic. So you need to find other people to talk to. So there you increase your sample size and you go out talking to more people um, to find out more about the topic. But again, there's a point at which you realize you've reached saturation when you've, you've spoken to enough people that in your interviews, people are saying things that other people have already said. You know, nobody's saying anything new. And at that point, you probably realize that you, you've come to the point of saturation. I feel saturated by it. Now, there's no numerical bottom line here. This is quite frustrating for people doing qualitative research because, you know, they say, how many participants do I need for my project? And the answer actually is, I don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. You know, so if you ask how many people do I need for, to interview for a qualitative research project, the answer will usually be, we don't know. We don't know until we start talking with people because we don't know at what point we'll have saturated our understanding of the topic. Maybe just one person who knows an awful lot, who've got a huge range of experience, and maybe they'll cover everything, but maybe it won't. Maybe we'll need two people, maybe five people, maybe 10 people. We have broad guidelines that are based on other people's experience of talking to people about particular topics, but they're usually just guidelines, you know? One thing we are um, usually guided by is how having, we usually have a sense of when it's gonna to be too many people. You know, what we can't say is how many people you need to interview, but we usually have an idea of how many would be too many because it's, becomes unfeasible. You know, it'll take too long. It'll take too long to run the interviews, be too expensive, and you'll have too much data. Now, onto sampling method. 
These two flowcharts here nicely sum up the differences by looking at the decision processes involved in sampling for a quantitative project compared to a qualitative project. So quantitative methods in psychology typically deploy the method of probability sampling. The aim is to achieve a random sample for the population we're interested in. And the focus is on a random sample because it's assumed that everything that happens in the natural world is random. Our job as a researcher is to impose meaning on that randomness through developing theories that can help us predict certain events. So when we sample, we need to assess the probability that our sample is random. What was that all about? It felt so random. You know, i.e. a true reflection of the natural state of things prior to any system of meaning being imposed on those things. This is based on this whole idea that the natural world exists independently of the meaning we impose upon it. That there's an objective world that's out there that exists independently from us. So science is about capturing that objective data, then finding meaning in it. And if the data has already been structured, has already had meaning imposed upon it, it's not random anymore, it's not objective anymore, and our sense-making will be impure. Now, it may take you a while to get your head around this. Sorry, I spoke quite quickly there. We've got a few things to get through, so you might replay it a few times. But don't worry, if you don't get it this time round, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this in part three of uh, this lecture, but also come back to other points in our unit, just to give you different ways of thinking about this concept, because it's quite abstract, but it is quite important. Okay, so... Qualitative methods takes a very different set of decisions based on a very different set of assumptions. It uses non-probability sampling because it's not interested in random samples. Qualitative methodology makes an assumption that events are not random but are pre-structured, that there is no objective external reality out there waiting for us just to observe it, but that our reality is subjective. The natural world exists through the way that we make sense of it. Our observations are therefore of subjective phenomena, of things that are already constructed by human sense making. And the job becomes one of understanding what that meaning is. It also doesn't assume that events are predictable because they are too complex to fit a predictive model. With qualitative sampling, we are purposefully searching out people who have something interesting to say about the topic that we're interested in exploring the meaning of. You know, the meaning that sits behind the events we're interested in. Now, let's talk about the role of the researcher, because this is linked to all of this. Because reality is seen as existing independently and objectively from the observer, under quantitative research, we need researchers to be objective so that they can accurately capture that data. We need researchers who are trained in objectivity to remain socially and politically neutral. But because reality is seen as existing through the subjectivity of the researcher, under qualitative research, we need researchers to be able to fully engage with their subjectivity and to share that subjectivity with others. We need researchers who are trained in the skill of reflexivity, to be socially and politically engaged. You know, to be in touch with your feelings. You see, Bob... He's in touch with his feelings. Now here's one of the main points of antagonism between quantitative and qualitative research. Qualitative researchers typically don't believe quantitative research can be objective. They see quantitative research as engaged, engaged in a kind of futile and impossible task. You know, there's no such thing as an objective reality that's independently existent reality. Give it up, Gizmo! Your robot rampage is over! Quantitative researchers, on the other hand, will view qualitative researchers as biased and not engaged in proper science. You know, the qualitative research is future, futile because nothing is assumed to be real under qualitative research. It's all made up stuff. You know, it's all stuff that's just made up in our heads. There's no objective reality. And it makes them feel like nothing's real except for them. That's all it is. Now let's just focus a little more on reflexivity by returning to that research topic we looked at earlier, you know, safe sex, unprotected sex. And unprotected, sorry, safe sex isn't unprotected sex. <laughs> right, unprotected sex, okay? So, um, what I'd like you to do is um, to read an article that I've set for you, put up on Moodle for you for next week. And when you read the article, I want you to ask yourself 
about how your own life experience, your own identity, your own cultural beliefs, etc., would have shaped how you would have undertaken that research. Now, one way of considering this is just by thinking about going to interview someone about the topic and start off by thinking about what you would be wearing. How might the way you dress impact the assumptions the interviewee makes about you when you meet them? And how might that impact the conversation you have? What the hell are you wearing? This is the Mirabal suit. Then I want you to dig in a little deeper and think about other aspects of your identity that might be visible, you know, your gender, your ethnicity, your age, and so on. And then I want you to dig a little deeper still and think about the things that might be less visible to the interviewee, but might impact the interview. You know, your worldview, your assumptions, such things might be informed by your gender, ethnicity, and age, but might not be readily obvious to the interviewee. Maybe write down some of those assumptions that you hold. Give you an example. Say if you believe that people of all genders and all sexual orientations have a right to enjoy sex in whatever form they wish, as long as both people are consenting adults. Now, what if the interviewee states that they believe only in monogamous heterosexual relationships and they objected to sex outside of marriage? How might you react? How might, how might you stay neutral? Would you want to stay neutral? Would you feel you'd had to stay neutral? Would you show your discomfort or would you try to mask your discomfort? Think about how you might respond to the interviewee and how the interview might go. Okay, let's move on to that penultimate area from our table, which is quality issues. We're going to wait to the final bit, um, epistemology and ontology. We're going to handle that in part three of lecture one, so the next video. So this is going to be the last bit we're going to look at just in this video, all about on quality. And the ontology and epistemology stuff, that's quite abstract. You know, it's quite, quite, quite conceptual, quite deep. So we're going to take our time with that. We're going to be a bit slower with that stuff. You know, it takes some special time to take on board all of that material. Now, quality. Okay, so both quantitative and qualitative methods are concerned with issues of quality through promoting rigor and validity or authenticity. And they deal with the issue in a very different, in very different ways. Whereas quantitative research talks about internal and external validity, qualitative research talks about credibility and transferability. Whereas quantitative research talks about reliability and objectivity, qualitative work talks, talks about dependability, confirma confirmability, and reflexivity. So let's look at each of these quality indicators in qualitative research. Now, we've already talked about reflexivity, so here let's define credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. Credibility. Are the findings believable and credible to the participants and to other researchers? And how do you find this out? Well, you can perform what's known as member checks. Take your findings back to participants and see if they think your findings make sense. Or take your findings to a conference and see if your findings make sense to your peers. Does that make any sense to you? You might find that after doing this, you need to change your findings, change your analysis, and so on. Transferability. This is all about whether the findings describe clearly enough the context of the data, you know, the, 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 how the data was collected, the reflexivity of the, the, the researcher. It's enough detail provided to allow someone else to assess the... A, 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 did I just spit then? Jeez. It's, uh, someone, can, someone can decide how applicable your research is to their context. So here we're not talking about generalizability, but about transferring our findings to similar situations, not to all situations. So how do you, do, how do you find this out? Well, you could ask someone to describe back to you your method and check to see if their picture of it is as complete as your picture of it. You know, so you... You write down your method, ask someone to then describe the method in their own words and see if it matches what you know your method to have been. Now, repeat back what I just said. If they can paint a picture that's similar to the picture <laughs> of the thing that you're doing, you know what I mean. Do you know what I mean? Leave me a comment if you don't. <laughs> I'll get to it. Dependability. Were the findings primarily the result of the method or the researcher, 
or were they relatively independent of the method and the researcher? Now, this is not the same thing as objectivity, but it's asking whether our subjective interpretation of the data is something other than idiosyncratic to us or the method that we used. You know, is our subjectiv subjectivity sufficiently shared by others? I've lost the ability to speak. This is going to be a problem for a qualitative interview. <laughs> oh, dear. We're coming to the close of this video. Um, I, <laughs> just as well, <laughs> given I can't speak proper anymore. I need a lie down. It's the heat, I tell you. It's the heat, not the intellect. Okay, so um, is our subjectivity sufficiently shared by others? Would someone else, similar to us, see the thing in the same way? You know? Um, you know, is it... Is it re have we looked at things in a way that someone else who's similar to us would see it? You know, is our interpretation reasonable? I suppose that's what I'm saying. Confirmability. This is all about asking whether others would come to similar conclusions from the same data set. So it's, you know, parallel to that previous one. Okay, let's leave it there. <laughs> I, I, I need to sleep. So do you probably. So in part three, final part of lecture one, we will be taking on ontology and epistemology. So yum yum, I shall get back my power of speech before then. So see you soon. Ta-da.